education session this morning. Uh, I'm Amy Thurlow and I'm a member of the Education Council and uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our presenters today. Um, just before we get to the to individual presenters, uh, uh, by way of history, this is our third annual research presentation at the CPRS National Conference. Um, and this session started as an idea on the Education Council um, and, and part of our Educators Roundtable uh, to try and raise the profile of academic research um, and educational research in public relations and communications management and to really work to make connections between researchers and practitioners um, so that we're aware of what's being done in the field and um, what advances being being made and the body of knowledge that's available to practitioners and educators in public relations and communications management. We've tried uh, explored, I will say, three different formats with our research presentations over the years and we're still um, uh, exploring what will be the most useful way to connect with practitioners at the conference and to profile educators. Um, in previous years, you may recall, we had a poster um, presentation sort of in the hallway format where we had a number of posters and people milled through and, and on their own time looked at the posters. Last year, we had a number of presenters do very short presentations, just sort of broad strokes of their research. Um, and this year, we decided to go with a format where we chose just two presentations from the submissions that we received. Um, they go through a peer review process, and um, these two presentations were uh, awarded the, the opportunity to present. And we're giving each presenter a little more time this year so that we can really get some in-depth look into their analysis and background of their research. Um, so you let us know how you like the, the format of a little bit more in-depth on a smaller number of presentations. Um, and as we go forward, we'll be, we'll be looking at how that works for people and how to, to maybe explore or expand our sessions in future. So on that note, uh, we have two presenters today. Uh, Dr. Terry Flynn from McMaster University will be our first presenter. And his presentation is, Do They Have What It Takes? an analysis of competency, skills, and knowledge of Canadian public relations practitioners. And Susan M. is uh, doing a presentation on best practices for media relations in a shifting world, which sounds like a very interesting uh, uh, and timely topic, for sure. Um, <coughs> just before I introduce uh, Terry, he, we're excited also because his presentation has received support from the Communications and Public Relations Foundation. And for those of you who are not familiar with the foundation, it's an organization that's um, dedicated to advancing the field of public relations and communications management through education and research. So uh, two years ago, I'm looking at Barbara Sheffield, our executive director is here in the audience too. We, um, we decided that we, we have been working for years uh, funding scholarships and research grants to students. Um, and about two years ago, we decided, you know, we really want to expand the impact that we're having in terms of developing public relations research and making it accessible to practitioners and connecting with the academic community. Um, so we've developed an RFP process and, and a research funding process. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, Dr. Flynn and his, his uh, team from McMaster is the first recipient of that funding research. So we from the foundation are very uh, proud to be able to, to see that here at the conference as well. So no pressure, but. <laughs> and the second award will be made in August, September. That's right. Yes, we have an RFP out and, and another award coming. So I'm um, certainly feeling like a lot of um, uh, momentum and, and groundwork being done there in terms of connecting practitioners and research, which fits with this session perfectly. So without further ado, Terry. Right, thank you. Now we are videotaping these presentations for uh, use by the foundation, actually, so that uh, they can post it on their website. But also, I think it's critical that uh, part of research is, and especially a lot of funded agencies now want to know what what you're doing to mobilize the knowledge. How, how are you going to transmit the knowledge to people uh, that might not be in this uh, presentation? So that's how we're going to do it. We're, we'll. Uh, so Sarah Pram from our uh, program is here videotaping. So if you have any problems about being seen, if any of the police are looking for you, then you, <laughs> you might just want to leave now. But um, let me just get this ready. Uh, you also have a copy of the poster that uh, we presented. Um, and as uh, Susan and I found out, it, it 
probably takes more work than doing this PowerPoint presentation to put that pow poster together. So please make use of it and <laughs> really enjoy it. And because uh, we shared, we were uh, both working on it at the same time, sharing frustrations with different kinds of program software that we were using as well. So I um, just want to make mention that the uh, Communications and Public Relations Foundation did supply the uh, funding for this research. It's still ongoing. We're reporting 50% of the research that we've conducted to date. Um, uh, so I'm very pleased with that and the foundation's work is critical and if you think of the work that has been done, the research in the field of public relations, the Grunick Excellence Study was funded by the IBC Foundation, uh, $400,000 so you know if you could just pass the hat around maybe we could collect some more about for that. But the foundation is very, very critical for what we do and the fact that it's peer reviewed also helps academics to say that this is a worthy process for us in terms of our our tenured process. Um, it was around this time last year, in fact I think it was due June 15th that the, the uh, submission was. So we gathered a, uh, a research team at McMaster that includes both Alex uh, Sevigny and Dr. Philip Savage that are co-investigators and then we have a, a number of research st students both at the graduate level and the undergraduate level. Um, this is also good because our universities are trying to figure out how other than the tri-council funding, tri-council funding being SHRC and NSERC and CIHR. So those are the traditional funding bodies. But now they're looking at how do we get other sources of, of uh, revenue in to help with research. So this research grant actually helped us in our department figure out how we do that. So it, um, it was instrumental for us. And the funds that were used for this project allowed us to not only come and travel here, but I actually hire graduate students and I think that's an important part so that they get a critical part of it. Um, so the purpose of the study is to really understand what the field possesses, to what degree they have uh, certain levels of competency, skills and knowledge. Um, how do they marry in with 21st century competency skills because we can't look at ourselves just in isolation. We have to look at ourselves within the disciplines that, that, uh, that we work within. And then to understand what kind of gaps, if there are any, uh, exist between what's the ideal and where the practice is right now. So the share, the, what we'll share with you today really is and the first two phases of this project. Uh, we've done, conducted a literature review, quite a comprehensive literature review. We've done a content analysis of job postings to see, you know, because that's the reality. You know, you could do all this theory and literature and, and uh, you know, pathways that we do, but what's the profession really hiring? Uh, well, depth interviews with hiring managers to again validate where are they doing? Because job ads are one thing, and you can say certain things, but what are the other criteria that they're looking at? And then we're going to do an online survey of practitioners. We're going to benchmark that against some studies that have been published in the Anglosphere. And then we're going to try to understand what the implications for the professions here are in Canada. Uh, as I said, the first two are completed. We're in field now with, uh, department, uh, with hiring managers. So if you know anybody that is, does a lot of hiring uh, at all levels, um, then please put them in touch with us because we want to get to them, uh, do face-to-face -face interviews with them or one-on-one -on -one interviews. And then in the fall, we'll start an online uh, survey of practitioners. So uh, literature review, this is like most people just die when you say this. And like, why would you ever want to do a literature review? And because it, it allows us to kind of gather a, a state of the, of the practice. What are people saying in it? Not just in our own, but what are, what are organizations really talking about? And when I talk about big organizations, people like the OECD, you know, what are they looking at and, uh, and, and how do we deal with that? And are there certain competencies that 21st century um, employees need to have that 20th century, like us, ha didn't have to have. And I put this in. This was a competency in the 20th century. How to develop black and white photos. <laughs> Guess what? You don't need that anymore, right? No, how to use a buggy whip from the uh, 19th century. And then are there any specific competencies, skills, and knowledge within the profession that, you know, the, uh, the Pathway document did a lot of work to kind of gather that, but, but are, they, are they being written about in a regular basis? Um, what we did find is that these three words are thrown about quite interchangeably. There's a lot of confusion before, be, beyond them. And even the OECD in the report said, you know, that competency is more than just knowledge and skills. It's behavior. It's uh, sort of psychosocial in terms of what they are. Uh, but uh, Anne Gregory, who's the actually incoming chair of the Global Alliance, she's at Leeds University, I think, in the UK, I think really set it out. Said, knowledge is, what do they need to know? 
Skills are what do they need to do? And competencies are what's the behavior that we really require. So I think that really helped in, in, in terms of solidifying that level of discussion that we can have because um, it's like goals and objectives. Whenever you hear people talk about them, they, everybody's even uh, mixed on that. So uh, after this exhaustive literature review that I think it's about 60 pages in length, um, here are the 21st century skills that are, uh, these are the recognized skills that 21st century employees are required or suggested to have. No specific ordering, they're not rank ordered in any way, but um, they came out as the, uh, uh, as, as the most obvious in terms of the research. So information process, how do we, how do we make sense of all the information that we get today? Um, how do we manage it? And not just from a technical standpoint, but from a, from a psychological perspective as well. Because how are you making sense of the 3,200 emails that you get uh, from that? Uh, the competency uh, in terms of communication skills. That they're looking for people that have good communication skills. And that means both, that means both from a presentation standpoint, writing standpoint as well. Uh, they're looking at people who can work well with, in teams, that can collaborate well. Uh, that they have a knowledge of ICTs, critically important today, uh, that they're innovative, they're flexible, and then they have this level of problem solving and critical thinking. So that's the macro level global skills. Didn't matter where you work, managers are looking for, do you have these kind of competency? And when we go to the hiring managers, we're gonna ask them, in fact, to rate these, you know, how important they are to that, that particular person. Because they're not just hiring a public relations person, they're hiring a person that's going to help contribute to the organization goals and objectives. Oh. Uh, from the public relations competency, we do in fact see some similarities. So yes, they want ICT competencies because now as social media starts to begin to, to overwhelm and develop. Uh, cultural competencies, which are not on the global list, which is interesting. And what they're saying is that, you know, in, and not just globally culture, culture specific to certain audiences and, and uh, community stakeholder groups as well. Ethics, we had a good conversation here in um, just in the Educator Roundtable that this is a competency that, that is being hired for. And then there's this group of business level skills, competencies and knowledge that is now starting to be shown that probably 10 years ago would not have been there. But that discussion about if we're taking this to this next level of management then you need to be, understand strategic planning, you have to understand anal analytics as well. And then traditional crisis management and relationship building. So what does it mean? Well, employers are looking for more general transferable skills. Uh, so we, want, we don't want spe specialists just in social media, we want people that can be able to do things and it reminded me when I was writing this up that when I was uh, about 15, I had a job at a grocery store and I had, was doing all these stupid jobs and I went to the guy and I said, I wanna work in the dairy section. That's where I wanna work. He mm -hmm. said, so, no, I want you to be my jack of all trades. And I hated that. But that's a generalist I and mean, that's what people are looking for. We want people who are generalists rather than specialists in that way. And then, of course, the studies continue to show the priority of, and we again had this conversation this morning, the importance of written and verbal communications and how that is a growing concern within the literature. Um, within the, this technology, why is this growing more important, social media, but this sense of why we're even doing this video? And to be able to use that as a new platform to be able to communicate, and what does that mean? You have to have that video editing, and it's not just a matter of running the camera, but you have to be able to use the software and creating that content and then optimizing it for to be able to find and be found as well. And then even this is a this is a competency that the UIB in the US have identified in their uh, their um, uh, in their programming as well. Information management, knowledge of distribution channels and technology and literacy as a growing one. Now so that that was the that was the um, the literature review now we wanted to want to see what's happening in reality. So uh, we asked CPRS for access to uh, job postings over the last three years. We also got some from IBC, a lot from LinkedIn as well. So we had a, a, a total population of around 650 potential job postings that we then sampled 280 from. And then our researchers went on and identified 28 different variables to code from. And that was again, location, job title, um, responsibility, skills, uh, salary if reported, uh, education as well. 
Uh, and then we had three coders do it, and it's important when you do this kind of testing that there's an inner coder reliability so that they were in fact coding those right variables correctly. And after a couple of rounds, we did in fact have a high level of inner coder reliability. So what were the pr preliminary uh, results? Total mentions, well, the skill, most important, 35% said writing. Right? There's, there will be a typo, probably, if you just make sure, because these were actually more, uh, these were the latest ones that uh, were just sent to me, so just make that change. So 35% said writing, strategic planning, about 20% media relations, and then project management. So these are the top five skills out of all those 200 and some job postings that we looked at that people are hiring for as you go through. In terms of responsibility, and again, different in terms of skill. These are the basic skills. Here's now becomes the responsibility that they want to, that 28%, nearly 30% said that, that uh, they will have a responsibility in the communication strategy area. And then the strategic planning. So if you look at that, nearly 50%, more, more than 50, 52% said, you know, there's some level of strategic planning management w uh, within the uh, responsibilities they would have. Uh, less on the traditional, oh, that, that should be 14%, not 114%, sorry. Design and media. So, you know, again, tactical or technical here, more strategic or more management on a higher level as well. Uh, results in terms of the education, 60% uh, for bachelors was not a big surprise. 1% uh, said high school. <laughs> that would be interesting. I'd like to sort of go back. But 17% said no, they didn't list specific educational requirements, which is interesting. Uh, what kind of uh, discipline within that? Well, 44% said specifically mentioned communication, um, marketing, public relations around the same. And again, 23% said no. Not, nothing. This should worry the people next door. 92% did not mention any kind of accreditation. And the fact that now, so there, here, here's where uh, we have to be careful about the sample, right? So we're pulling from IBC sampling. There's a higher level mention of cr accreditation within IBC postings than even our CPRS one as well because the IBC accredited numbers are far less than CPRS accreditation numbers, just in terms of raw numbers as well. So, what are the conclusions? Uh, well, there, the good news is that the Pathways document, there's strong alignment between the curriculum that was developed, curriculum and suggestions developed, and the competency, skills, and knowledge of the, the study had found. So that's a good validation of what we've gone out, and again, a validation of the, in fact, the, uh, the recognition programs as well. And if educational institutions, in fact, enact the pathways, that they're going to increase the competency, skills, and knowledge. And again, what will test that and what will validate for us with that is the PRK examination. Uh, they're good evaluative methods, but they really don't test um, measures of competencies in terms of ICT skills or something. So we're not, and we're not answering in that respect. Hold on. It went way back. Um, Focus on traditional, so they're still focusing on the traditional skills that are required, writing, media relations, but there is a higher and growing number in terms of that higher level of uh, strategic competency. But there is a weak alignment in terms of the skills and responsibilities identified here and in the literature. So it'll be interesting in this next line to see, because job postings, they don't tell at all. You know, what are, the, what are the kind of intangible assets that they're not advertising for that they are in fact interviewing for and hiring for as well? So uh, next steps, we're gonna, we're, uh, we'll, uh, that we'll process this summer and in the fall. And then we will begin, continue to uh, present at different conferences. Uh, first phase of literature review will be submitted to the Canadian Journal of Communication for publication. And then our target publication for the content analysis by itself is uh, public relations review. And then we're gonna post this on uh, CPRS Foundation and our websites as well for knowledge mobilization. And that's it. So, questions? Yes, Heather. So, um, just to taking it in quickly, is this a transition from a, a tactical uh, way to represent our profession to now it's more of a strategic profession? Is that what you're saying? Well, I think there's evidence that there is movement. There's more recognition of this, uh, the importance of 
communication strategy, corporate strategic planning in the advertised, advertised post. Um, what we haven't done here is broken down by level, right? So there's a level, so I'm sure that junior posts have more of the traditional technical creative uh, requirements that they're looking for, and the higher level posts are looking at more of the, of the strategic or strategic planning as well. Whereas before all of them right. more of the Right, so now we're seeing a distinction in, in terms of what that is. Yeah, Angel. In the sample two, so we're saying that it's most of the generalist view that seem to come through as opposed to specialists. Yeah, they're not, I mean, th some ads sp spoke specifically, but when you look at uh, no, them all together, 300 together, there's more, there's a clump of, we need to have these required, requisite level of competency, skills, and knowledge. And then they'll hire specifically accordingly to the industry, right? So. We don't. We didn't include here in terms of what that what the industry was, but there's there's lots of data, lots of data. Yeah, Amy. Um, so when you were selecting the job postings, did you uh, allow the posting institution to designate that it was a public relations job, like if it was on CPRS or IABC, or how much PR had to be in the job before? It was no, we just we just took the the post with the available posts from those three areas. And then we just selected from that, randomly selected from that. So we didn't select only jobs that said public relations or communication management. But, but if it was a marketing job solely, they would have been tossed out. And so it had to be still within that realm. Yeah, done. Were, were the posts that you looked at English only? They were English only, yes. Um, so it could be interesting to, to see. It could be, it could be. Yeah. Or yeah. And then the second question is, there was a time where there was a lot of language around change management skills yeah. in um, the recruitment. Did you notice? Any none, problem? none. Didn't come up even on a blip, change management. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Technology yeah. Technology term? Yeah. Yeah. Alex? Sorry, just did the accreditation process recently. What do you, what, why do you think accreditation is not on the way? Um, That's a uh, $64,000 question. Um, it's interesting. I, I mean, it would be interesting to go back and look at why IBC had, I mean, they're statistically the same. There's no difference between four and 3% really. But at the same time, I, I think in their job postings, maybe they spend more time with people posting on their website, making sure that they have accreditation in their job description than probably we do. You know, I don't think, I, I, I don't know for sure, but if, if it's a payable job posting that's relative to public relations communication management, it probably goes on the CPRS website. And probably nobody spends any time with the person who's posting and saying, well, what about accreditation? To what degree? And maybe that's something that, that that's one way of, of really pushing that, to saying, look, if you want to be on our website, then what you should be doing is putting, you know, ABC or APR accreditation in that job posting. Yeah, Barbara? Can you also speak to the fact that both those organizations need to do more mm -hmm. in uh, communicating about the value of the designation? Yeah, yeah. So that may be something that can, at the end of this, can be referred to both organizations. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, I don't think we do enough. I don't think we spend enough time or, or effort in doing that. And it would be interesting just to have a conversation with those people that are posting those jobs to say, and well, we'll do that. We'll add that to the, uh, the hiring manager. To what degree do you post or, and why not? And I, and I think we'll find out pretty clearly why. Because it, it has no perceived value prep, potentially. Yeah, Senator. Um, you're going to be um, comparing your findings to findings from um, New Zealand and Yeah, UK benchmark. And Europe. Um, what about the US? Uh, I actually think we have a lot more similarity with those three other companies than the US, or uh, countries than the US. I mean, the US is far more advanced in everything else that they do, even in this field. I mean, we are, in our research phase, is still very foundational. And those are the same with Australia, New Zealand, and, and the UK. Uh, and probably um, we're. we're we're just in a better place, I think, to be able to compare the skills and what we do and how we think about public relations than the Americans do. I mean, there's a real different cultural 
um, perspective in terms of how pu public relations is practiced in the U.S. than here, and, 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 and there's probably a lot more similarities between how we do it and how uh, Australians, New Zealanders, and the U.K. do it. And it might be, you know, part not just culture, but style of government. Uh, when most of the people that pub practice public relations in Canada uh, work for governments, uh, that whole issue of public interest uh, goes back to that, uh, that focus as well. Yeah? So it's just more of a comment. It'd be interesting to see what they were looking for and then what they got. Yeah. Because you know how often you, I mean, you go talking to a client and they, this is what they think they want and what they end up with, with your expertise coming in and um, what they end up getting. And it'd be really interesting. Like I even interviews, I know even students have gone in and um, uh, had an interview and then they said that they were a member of your IEC or CPRS. Um, the hiring manager was impressed. It wasn't part of what they were looking right. for, but that was the differentiator. They yeah. Very involved in the profession. And, oh, okay. And that kind of pushed them up. But it wasn't something that was being looked for um, in the Cool. So if you know anybody that is uh, that does a lot of hiring, please send them uh, send me an email with their name, and we're going to reach out and uh, and we're looking at across the country as well. Uh, for this one, for these two phases, they will be bilingual as well. So the survey will be the online survey will be French and English, and we have some researchers that can uh, interview in uh, in French as well. Uh, to the thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. It's doing a thing with my uh, <laughs> my slides. It didn't quite look like that. Um, my name's Susan Amy, and uh, uh, I'm a great example of the wonderful program that uh, Alex now. Uh, is the director for and that uh, Terry set up of the Master of Communications Management that's at McMaster University. Uh, what I'm going to give you is a really brief top notes of my capstone project. And where it comes from is I spent 25 years as a journalist uh, in uh, the Hamilton Spectator. Most of that, uh, sometimes as a reporter, sometimes as an editor, and a portion of that time as a market researcher looking at um, and developing new products for the paper. And so, being in public relations the last 10 years, I've really been kind of fascinated with the changes happening in media relations. Um, and I hardly need to recap for you here, but uh, the aspect of the fact that the, um, uh, the growth of owned media that is that we can all now, you know, we have earned media, what we get from the, from the traditional media. Uh, we have paid media, obviously, but owned media, which is the, the websites, the publications, the um, uh, social media that any institution or company can set up now. So we have that. We can go direct connect. This is exactly what Gunnick said, right? The, the two-way, uh, symmetrical. We can allow for input. Do we really need traditional media? And we've seen the, the down, um, uh, downgrading or downsizing uh, of a lot of the traditional media over the last 10 years. And, uh, and <laughs> uh, some of them are, are accepting what we provide them much more readily than they would have uh, before. So I was, I've been fascinated with this idea. And I think that Sydney Matrix, who's an uh, associate professor at Queen's University in Media, uh, she said it very well in saying it, it, we really have a control crisis here uh, in media relations. So I'm going to get right to it. My research questions for my project were looking at, I wanted to look at the traditional roles that the media has for um, gatekeeping. Traditionally, you know, gatekeeping is that um, being the, the uh, gate where there's all this information going on, somebody has to decide what's important enough for those two, three, or 100 or 200 items that you're going to absorb today, what's really important. And also setting the uh, public agenda in Canada. And that's where 
my research, I've gotten into uh, not only uh, what journalists and public relations uh, practitioners think, but also what do policymakers, politicians, uh, and uh, communicators at that level, what uh, do they feel is changing here? Um, so agenda setting is that uh, the mass and media influences pu public opinion, if not by directly affecting the actual decision, at least by influencing what topics are going to be discussed. Now I was writing this back in January. This is before the whole Senate expenses and the Rob Ford situations happened, which have only ratified this. Uh, one of the most quoted lines uh, in, this, in this topic area is from a political scientist, Bernard Cohen, back in 1963. He said, the media doesn't, uh, is not successful in telling people what to think, but it's remarkably successful in telling people what to think about. Right. So, and we also now have, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, part of my lit review, which I'm not going to get into here, just to keep to the top notes, um, it, it looking at um, the media and, and how people say, well, now we've got all these different media, different ways of getting information, so there must be even more uh, topics out there to be discussed. But in actual fact, studies have shown that the, the traditional media and the topics being discussed on other media are the same, like a lot they're using. There's a lot of duplication. So I wanted to look into that. Also credibility. Um, who, who's being listened to? You know, is it the established media? Um, and is owned media being given any credibility? I'm, I'm, Terry's a hard act to follow and I'm not as used to giving presentations. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Conference Board of Canada, credibility leads to purchasing decisions. The less perceived control uh, or the management of PR between the information and the person getting it, then the more credibility it has. Or that's traditionally been the thought. And then how does this relate to us and our, and our, uh, our um, use of media, earned media. So I had two parts to my, my research. First, uh, quantitative. Um, although I did secondary research and uh, got a lot of read of what's going on with traditional media and new media in the country, I also had access to a 2007 study that uh, Leger Marketing did for Apex Public Relations in Toronto. And it was a national online study, over 1,500 people. It, and um, asking specifically about media use and media credibility. So I echoed that study with um, a study by uh, Leger as well, 1,500 people, the online uh, national um, panel they have of almost half a million people and uh, adjusted geographically and, and um, demographically. Um, so my study was done in November and it, I echoed some of the same questions that were asked in the first study so that it could be a, a contrast or so each study had a margin of error 2.5, 19 of 20 times. And this was the specific research questions that I asked. Um, I gave them a list and this is the answers that I got. Now this is on your little teeny weeny sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but um, what I have here, the full bar is, uh, is the weekly reach and the darker bars are daily reach. So that gives you a little sense for um, occasional versus uh, uh, regular readership or listening or leadership. So we have television news in 2007, television news in 2012, a radio um, and the newspapers 7 and 12, uh, news websites and that in the study was uh, uh, news websites not related to major media. So we weren't looking for a response on cbc.ca or, or the Globe Mail Online or anything. Um, and it gave some suggestions what those could be, Huffington Post um, and um, Yahoo or Google News. Um, and so you can see, and then company websites, social networking, that was like given suggestions, that was like Twitter and Facebook and blogs. So you can see in reach that the uh, traditional media still have a, a big majority uh, response, although it seems to be weakening a little bit. Um, and the uh, social media that we've been spending so much attention to in the last 10 years is not quite getting up there. So, 
the, there wasn't a difference demographically except by age. And you'll see here the red bars are the 18 to 34 year olds. And you'll see their uh, use of the traditional media, still uh, majority except for social networking. Um, it was still more in, over a week than the, um, uh, the social media. Um, and then the 55 plus are, are using the uh, websites and social media much less. Not a big surprise there. And then the research specific question I had about credibility was uh, rating the credibility one to five. And this is, this is also a chart on your little uh, placemat. And uh, it shows the difference between 2007 and 2012. So the credibility of the traditional media may be slipping a little bit and the others um, not really gaining a whole lot. We're not talking a big crowd here. Um, Okay, the second part of my, my study was in-depth interviews. Uh, interviews 45 minutes to an hour long uh, with senior influentials. I had six in uh, journalism, six from public relations, six in public policy. And this is what I wanted to find out from them. I wanted to uh, delineate any shifts they saw in the gatekeeping and agenda setting for media, measure credibility, and identify those best practices. Um, the people I interviewed included the Toronto Star publisher, uh, VP for content at Post Media, CBC's ombudsman, or he was at the time, <laughs> he's not now, uh, Huffington Post's managing editor, the managing directors for several of the PR firms, and I guess I didn't put it on here, also uh, talked with our president for CPRS. And among the politicals, I got uh, former cabinet minister, uh, former uh, Prime Minister's Office Communications Director, uh, Noel Hill Strategies, uh, the Waterloo Region Chair. So I got a good sample across, but it was purposive in that I chose them. I went for uh, people that would have strong opinions and knew the biz. So here's some of the uh, research findings I had. Now when I have a quote up on each of these, it doesn't mean they were the only person that had that opinion. In actual fact, 